Welcome. David, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you today. So, and you did it last minute. So, um, so many of us can are dealing yeah. with grief and loss and in a very compelling article, and I commented on it when you posted it at the end of February on Facebook, Right. you wrote back then that you had your own bout with grief and loss and depression. And the article is called Dancing with My Devil. So who mm -hmm. is the devil, Ken? Well, the devil is what oftentimes we perceive ourselves through the eyes of people around us. And um, we have a natural inclination. I think the human spirit is very charitable. And very loving, very caring to a point where sometimes we sacrifice ourselves for the greater good of what other people think and we want to play a certain role. And uh, what happens is when you're dancing with the devil, uh, you end up getting real comfortable with the dance step. Mm -hmm. You don't maybe subconsciously realize that at first, but eventually you get so good at it that you become sort of the Arthur Murray of, of dancing with the devil and you're great at it, but it, it's, it's, it's backwards because it's not something you want to excel at. And it connected to my story of when I left professional football. Uh, I grew up in a very athletic family. Uh, my dad played pro baseball. Uh, he played for the Cincinnati Reds and Philadelphia Phillies in the minor leagues. My mom was a good athlete. Uh, my sister was a great athlete. My younger brother is actually the best athlete in the family. I was probably middle of the range as far as the athletes in my family. I just, for some reason, decided to work awfully hard at being a hockey player and a football player and a baseball player, football sort of ended up being the choice I had taken. But um, once you play football all your life and, and you get to a certain point, it's not fun anymore. And it wasn't fun for me. It was very much a business. It was very competitive. And uh, to go in every day and knowing that you had to compete for your job, uh, they say you have 50,000 thoughts in your day uh, mm. and you're running through your mind in a day. Some say it's 100,000, but let's say 50,000. If it's based on 50,000 thoughts in a day, you look at a year, that's 24.3% of your time at work. But in football, it's more than a 40 hour work week. It's a 24 seven work week because you're worried about the guy who's gonna try to tear your head off on Saturday. You're worried about the guy who's trying to take your job. You're worried about making sure the coaches are happy. Uh, you could have 100 plays that go great, but the one play you screw up means you lose a job. And so um, I got real comfortable with dancing with the devil uh, to stay in the game. And that meant five knee surgeries, two ankle surgeries, you know, all the stuff. One time I went across the middle in Vancouver, and based on all the variables as a receiver, I knew I was going to get the ball. And I knew that I had a chance to maybe score a touchdown. I read the scenario wrong. And when I caught the ball and turned, uh, rather than look to see the free safety 10 yards away from me, all I remember were a set of brown eyes right in front of me. And when I woke up on the turf, the doctor's looking down at me. And I asked him what happened. He says, you got hit. And I said, no shit, I got hit. But what happened? It says you broke your nose, a couple of teeth through your lip, separated shoulder, and a concussion. And in a weird way, it felt great because in that alpha state of mind I was in playing football, it was a better to burn out than fade away mentality. So whatever came through playing tackle football, I was okay with. And that was part of my dance with the devil. And when I left football, when I finally left football, I remember sitting down, I'd get a piece of paper, and I was going to build my resume. And when you get your piece of paper and you, you name your title and all the stuff you're going to put on your resume, and I realized that the only companies that I was going to be able to work for would have been companies looking for a guy who can catch a football on second down in the red zone with everybody watching and we need 10 yards. Yeah, not, not, not a lot in demand. Everything I do today is really about, um, I never take for granted my talent. Uh, everybody has talent. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always really enjoyed being the guy who you looked at a team picture, a photo of a team and say, okay, who's the, who would have went pro, do you think? And I always, everybody always picks up the natural athletes. I was a pretty good athlete, but uh, I loved to work. I really did. Your devil didn't have your back. No. Or, or quarterback in this case. Um, share your journey as to what happened during the game where you heard a pop and that, that was it. That, that, and that wasn't your first knee injury. This was No, like, that was another injury. Throwing the ball to you and that, that really was. Yeah. yeah, well, the funny thing is every football player has that moment where things go direly wrong out there on the field. And, uh, I've, you know, I've been knocked down. I've torn a rib curls, all kinds of stuff. But uh, the one thing that, that it, it, you always fear as an athlete is a knee injury. And uh, psychologically, I was already sort of at one foot out of the game, thinking about life beyond the game. And I was with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. We went to Toronto to play the Argos in the Sky Dome. And there's a great receiver who played for Saskatchewan in Toronto. His name was Jeff Fairholm. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And Jeff and I were in the same draft class. So we knew each other well enough. And and I saw him before the game, before we went out for a warm up, and had a big knee brace on. And uh, the mental mess that put me through uh, carried on to the game. I had an average warm up. I didn't feel completely comfortable. And in the game, I caught a couple of passes, uh, running routes that I've run a million times, and and I struggled catching the ball. And I remember going back to the huddle after one of those plays, telling myself, thinking the mental talk, uh, get your head out of your backside before someone kills you out here. And so I, uh, I got to the huddle, and Reggie Slack, our quarterback, calls a play. And based on all the information that's pre-snap and what's about to happen, I have a pretty good idea that I'm going to get a ball. And he said, I'm going to run the very best hook route I've ever run in my life. And I did. I could never run that route any better than that moment. And I turned and the seas, the seas had parted and Reggie Slack was looking at me 15, 20 yards away from me threw a perfect pass right between the numbers. And as I caught the ball and I planted, my knee hyperextended and blew. And uh, in that moment, uh, I knew that things had changed dramatically. I knew that this was more than just an injury that I'd get back three to six weeks from, this was going to be a big one. And uh, when they diagnosed the knee, that I blown up my ACL, I remember they put me on the gator, the transport to take you off the field. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, when I looked over to the bench, all my teammates, all my fellow warriors, there was already that distance between the two of us, between all of us and, and myself. And I knew that uh, I was a fallen soldier. And when you're a battle of war now, it's football. It's not, much, it's not war. It's not life and death, but it, you get this mindset that it is war. And it's it either a commodity or, an, or a liability. Yeah. And if you're injured, you're a liability. You can't do much for the team. Yeah. And uh, you never visit guys in the hospital when they have knee injuries. Shoulder injury, sure. Maybe a concussion, sure. Some injuries, yeah. But a knee injury, you don't go near. Because if it gets into your head, if it can happen to him, it can happen to me. And you need to have this false sense of security, this invincibility to survive the sport. Yeah. But there's also a good thing because I left the game, but then I realized from an identity standpoint, I was so wrapped up in being a football player that uh, when I left the game, I had to go back to the game and dance with that devil I knew. Rather than dance with the devil I didn't know, which was the future, the unknown. And right. that, that's why I went back because it's almost like you hear about those abusive relationships. And people say, well, why do people go back to abusive relationships? It's because they dance with the devil they know. Better than the one you don't. There's a quote in your article that yeah. it's a fine line that separates courage and obsession. Yeah. What was that line for you? Well, again, it goes back to the idea of confidence and believing what you believe. And um, again, 50,000 thoughts in a day, whatever the number is going to be. And um, how we're able to navigate those thoughts and direct the traffic is so important to our success because in the morning when we wake up and people don't realize it, and, uh, but we either consciously or subconsciously always ask ourselves this very first question we wake up and it's, are we in our right time in our right place? Right? Cause you wake up and you're putting your clothes on, you get ready for your day and you're going to a job. Maybe you hate, maybe you're in a relationship. You don't not really feeling comfortable in anymore. Things change. Uh, nothing is constant. There's never ever that home run. And all of a sudden life is easy afterwards. Ask anybody who won a lottery. They mm -hmm. ask them, hey, you must be living it pretty easy winning a lottery, 5.5 million. I know five lottery winners. And there are days where they've said, you know, I kind of wish I didn't have, I hadn't won. Because life got awfully complicated. And so how we navigate our thoughts and how we start our day, and are we in our right place in the right time? I was there in football for the longest time and getting hit and getting the crap kicked out of me, I was okay with. But there was a moment somewhere along the way when my body and my mind said, that suit doesn't fit you anymore. Time to change your wardrobe. And But again, you get so caught up and, and connected to that role, that, that, that place you're in for so long. The idea of going and changing clothes, you're far more comfortable wearing something that's out of style but still fits you. It's funny, you, you said in your article that you were thinking already of life after football. Yeah. And and here you are, you're on this, you know, getting surgery done, your second knee surgery, and you you were really forced to think of, of, of life after football. And as you already alluded to, you know, life after football for you, you know, it was really hard to uh, uh, apply for to a company that's looking for a, a wide receiver, uh, you know, mm. Canadian-born non-import. So yeah. how did you deal with this sudden death, pardon the expression, I don't mean a playoff game, 
of life and work as you knew it, Ken? How did you deal with that? I looked around me and I fell into the trap of trying to find uh, satisfaction and fulfillment uh, based on what other people were doing. Mm. So I ended up signing up to take a computer programming course at the local college and here in town. In yeah. Ottawa. Oh, gone. And uh, it was actually CDI college. Oh, okay. Right downtown. Yeah. There's nothing about me that knows computer programming. There's nothing about me that enjoyed computer programming, but I was going to change clothes, right? I was going to go to the closet and change and new direction, everything else. And everybody else was doing it. And so I followed suit. And the trap there is one, you lose your uniqueness because you're doing something again, you don't want to do that everybody else is doing. And um, it ended up costing me with 17 grand because that's the course, right? And the whole bit. And uh, near the, about the midway point when I realized it wasn't going as well as I had, uh, I got a call from Don Southern, who was then the coach of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And he asked me if I could still play. And I lied my ass off and said, yes. Oh, no. And I went back. And I was a mere shadow of the player I was. But I went back to dance with that devil that I knew because we were doing a really good two-step. We were really good dancing together. And I tried to capture lightning in a bottle again. Man, how long did it take you then to slowly recreate yourself? It took me about a year and a half. And then I ended up auditioning, uh, doing a demo for the local TV station because I knew that they were looking for a sports guy. And I knew they were changing their format similar to the city TV's format in Toronto where Jim, Jim McKenney was doing sports there. Yeah. And I had done my grade 13 in Toronto. So I was familiar with the style. And I did my demo. I didn't think it was very good, but it felt like there was something worth pursuing and spending my time on. And so I made an appointment with the sales director and maybe join the sales team because I didn't think I'd do very well. And then the station manager walked in and said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I didn't think I did very well, but I'll take the long route around the block to get to where I need to go. And he says, you weren't that bad, but what we'll do is we'll work at it. And that's all I need to hear. And I became that same Canadian receiver in training camp who had to learn from Ray Algard and all those great receivers that I met along the way to become competent, to become competent. I know the, uh, uh, I believe it was Connor that mentioned the four stages of learning mm -hmm. and unconscious incompetence yesterday and conscious competence. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's essentially, that's what everybody goes through when you have to learn something new to hone your craft. And I was in a position where I wanted to really hone my craft and become uh, competent at what I was doing. And it worked out well because I did it for 11 years. Wow. And was that at the new CHRO? That was a new RO, CHRO. And then eventually I did some work for CTV and uh, fortunate, perhaps one of the best teams I've ever been a part of. Uh, a great team of people because they were all young, coming out of school and figuring out their way and competing with the giant here in town, which was CTV and Max Keeping in that team. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it was a David and Goliath battle, and, and we loved every moment together. Now, you said you I, – I, I, I kind of glossed over this, and I want to go back to it. You said you you went back to football after your second knee surgery. and you. I did. I, uh, How long did that last? And, and I actually know it. The funny thing is I had a total of five knee surgeries. I had, the major oh. re I had the major repair, and then I built scar tissue up, so they went in four more times. This, again, my desperate need to get back to where I thought I would – be okay when I was just jumping back into the fire pit uh, five knee surgeries uh, uh, one failed relationship bad relationship guy girl stuff and uh, I just was desperate to again connect somewhere along the way where I can wake up in the morning and go and I, I feel some semblance of value and so I went back and again it, I was nowhere close to being good as good as I thought I was and then uh, the next year I signed to play here for Ottawa with Gurney Henley, who was my coach in Hamilton. He was GM here in Ottawa at the time and paid me a nice chunk of change to, and I think he wanted more of a guy in the locker room, a leader versus the player that I used to be. And it was a, it was a good way for me to close my, my career. So at least you went out with some dignity. Yeah. But eventually it did come to, you know, sort of to a close. What did you learn about, about yourself, Ken? en route to a new you? What I learned is that um, we, all, we all have this ability to adjust, to transition, to adapt, and to overcome. The number one thing you have to do is one, trust that you can do it. If we couldn't do it as a species, we wouldn't be in the position where we are today. 
somebody else would be king of the land, king of the globe. We have uh, an innate uh, passion, desire to strive, to compete, to collaborate, to communicate. And a lot of stuff I learned in football, I really wasn't able to quantify until I left football. And I realized that uh, I learned a lot of things through football that will made me successful to this day. Yeah. And uh, that whole, the idea of the old school coach was wrong. The old school coach would scream, jump, and everybody had to say how high. And that was that was reflective of sort of pre-70s type coaching, or even 70s coaching where the coach was never wrong. But in, the, in, in business and in industry, specifically more towards uh, software and the technological side of things, uh, there was a shift from leadership from you have this triangle sort of setup where you had the CEO, the omnipotent one on top of the triangle, and a decree would come down. And everybody, everybody will just follow the decree, whether it made sense or not. And, but then uh, there was an evolution in terms of leadership. There are more voices at the table. doesn't mean we're going to use every idea that's, that's, that's shared at the table, but the more voices you have, uh, the more opportunities you can to figure out solutions. Uh, it's letting other people look at the map. And uh, I realized through football uh, that I had learned how to read the map. I learned how to lead. I learned how to coach through great coaches and great leaders and through bad coaches and bad leaders as well. Yeah. Um, I won't get into who, who was bad and who was good, but um, I used mm -hmm. to, I, I'm from Ottawa originally. I'm now in Toronto. Yep. And I used to work out at Good Life at Pinecrest. And I, I would run into George Brancato quite often. Yeah, George would be there. I'd see him there. And uh, Ace Powell would work out there. Oh, yeah. Ace, he was her yeah. coach at uh, Sir Robert Borden. Yeah. I went to high school. Uh, um, so there are a lot of people that are going through loss and changing their careers. What would you, how would you coach them to sort of keep it together and mm. look at this sort of loss maybe as an opportunity to recreate? Well, how would you coach, you know, somebody watching right now going to, oh, I just lost my job. Well, at first, my first thought is that uh, it's not easy. Mm -mm. It's not easy sort of letting go. It's not easy saying, okay, time to, rewrite or redefine who we are you hear that i often hear that she can you you really did a great job redefining yourself i really didn't redefine myself what i did was i i grew and to grow what you have to do is one be willing to step out of that place you were and that transition william bridges has a great book called transitions it's making sense of sort of life and life's changes and for something to change for you to do something new something has to die and, and you have to let it go. And uh, it's the toughest thing you can do sometimes uh, because you feel like you're stepping out from a comfort zone onto the a high wire. And you have to remind yourself and realize that you already have the skills. You, you know, there are some great coaches and great speakers out there and they've been doing it for years. And essentially what they've done is make a living reminding people that we already have this innate ability to do what we do, to move on to something else, to get past our first love to get past that, that tough job, that great job we had that we lost or a failed business or whatever it's going to be. Uh, it's tough, uh, but the ability to shed and, and not carry it with you. Uh, it's tough to fly with a piano on your back. And uh, I've learned that, uh, especially from football and even from my, my parents. You know, uh, my, my dad came from a family of uh, 10 brothers and one sister. Mm. And my mom came from a family that didn't have a whole lot. And uh, when my dad signed to play baseball and go down to Florida, and there he is with Pete Rose and Richie Allen and these type of athletes at camp, uh, he's just a kid from Canada who can throw a ball hard and got homesick. And they flew my mom down there to spend time with him. It was his girlfriend at the time. And they got married in Tampa. And for them to live together, she had to dye her hair blonde because my mom's mulatto. My grandfather is black. And, and uh, they overcame a lot and transition had to let a lot of stuff go. They had a loyalty to their neighborhoods, but for them to survive, they had to let a lot of stuff go. For them to be able to parent and break the cycle of some of the bad parenting they got to become the great parents they are today, they had to transition and let some stuff go. And what about the, you know, we have to let go, but we also have to go through a process of mourning. And, mm -hmm. and did you do that in your own transition? Yeah. From, oh yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. There were nights where, it was pretty dark. 
it was pretty dark and, and you start questioning who you are, what you believe in and doubting. And, um, you need to get through that and go back to the, again, you got to connect. First off, don't navigate that, that, that course on your own. There are people in your lives that really care. So connect and then communicate. Don't communicate based on just all the good things, all the bugaboos, all the peccadillos, all the fears, all the angst, throw it out there and then start to collaborate and collaborate means let's okay let's start the game plan let's start to figure out some solutions what what's our next best step don't think about a year from now or two years from now oh my god what, what am i going to become let's think about tomorrow and the day after and build some momentum then you start getting okay i got a little momentum now i want to compete right now i want to compete and get out there in you know, training camp i feel pretty good about myself I'm, I'm competing with guys from texas and oklahoma and all these schools i'm pretty good developing some confidence okay now i want to compete right and, and then you make the team, next thing you know, you're starting to receiver or whatever it is, the role you've taken on, and you get a chance to now go out and conquer. And, and, uh, I, and I can't remember scores. I, I can't remember one score of one football game I played. Hmm. But ask me about Lonzel Hill or Wally Zatilny or Richard Nurse or Pete Givtopoulos or Rocket Ishmael or Mike Clemens or Earl Wolf. I can go on ad nauseum for an hour listing guys that I'm still connected to today. Wow. Because of the you know, the competition. And because we let football go and we walked away from the game, we are still so deeply connected through those, those relationships. Yeah. Who got you through those challenging times? My, my dad, my mom, my brother, my sisters. Um, my family was really, is to this day, still very close. We didn't have a whole lot. Uh, grew up downtown, uh, center town, at the Boys and Girls Club. And uh, we didn't have a we didn't have a whole lot of money, but we didn't know we were poor because we were wealthy through the experiences we had with my mom and my dad and all our friends that we had. Um, it was a great neighborhood. I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. I don't think you have neighborhoods anymore where we're a bunch of meerkats. It's like we're a bunch of meerkats. And if someone from another neighborhood walked in the, into our, down our street, it's like, okay, who the heck is that? Right. You don't have that anymore, that loyalty, that, that devotion to the people on your block where you didn't have to worry about curfew. Everybody knew, hey, listen, let the kids can stay out there on summer holidays, stay out till 11 o'clock. Just don't be making noise. Okay? The first time we realized we were poor is when my dad said, hey, we're going trick-or-treating. Come on, everybody get in the car. Well, one Halloween after we already did our area. And he, he got this idea to take us to Island Park. Oh, yeah, nice area. And everybody's got a laneway and everybody has a tree, Right. And you go to the door and trick or treat and they give you stuff and they were giving away money. So I said, dad, holy shit, they're giving away money. So what's going on with that? He says, son, it's called UNICEF. And it's for people who are in need with a lot of poverty. Went, shit, that's us. And I spent the next year trying to get myself a UNICEF box so I could make some money the next Halloween. <laughs> a little orange and black box. Orange and black box. You remember it? Yeah. Last question. If someone is really hurting right now, maybe it's a CEO whose company is on the brink. Yeah. They have let thousands of layoffs or it's a single mom who lost her gig and doesn't know, you know, we just talked to Mary Lou about this, you know, yeah. he was in the restaurant business and you know what's going on there. Yeah. So it's a single mom who lost her gig, doesn't know what next. What wisdom would you share in times where things in life look out of control and they seem absolutely devastating? Number one, I think, um, Find your authenticity. Uh, and there's a strength there. You may not realize it, but there's a strength there. Uh, if you're a CEO and you're all of a sudden you have to let people go, uh, the CEO is going to learn a lot about what type of leader he or she was based on the response from the people he's letting go. If they say, you know what, we understand. And you let us, and there's nothing you can do about this. There's nothing you can do to avoid the decision you have to make because it's a global pandemic. Uh, we trust you and we've trusted you and you've led us uh, in a direction that's always kept our, our interests uh, as priority number one, then that, that leader can hang their hat on that. For a, a, a woman who's losing her job or a dad who has to come home and feed the kids and whatever, one, uh, don't make it too, it's a, it's a big moment, but begin to let it go and know that everything's going to be okay. Know that you have it within you to get through it, but don't do it alone. There's a lot of people out there who uh, 
think they have to walk alone and they don't because there's so many it's not like this is a singular issue for one person who just lost their job i can walk down the street you can walk down the street and you're going to meet 50 people who have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after that the day after that and in, in, a, in an ironic type of way there's a great opportunity for us here to reconnect to some of the things that are really important and to simplify life right i'm a father of three kids Work has really been challenged because of this whole global pandemic setback. I don't even know if there's going to be safe house either. So, so we, there's so, so many unknowns. And you can dwell on the unknowns. And it's like trying to punch Sugar Ray Leonard in the dark. You're not going to be successful. No. So stay away from the unknowns. You know, focus on what you know. Know what you know. And, and wake up uh, still grateful. Still wanting to love and care. And know that uh, there's going to be a better day. And if if it's not tomorrow, know that there's a warrior inside of you that has the ability to get through it. And, and it's going to get tougher for a lot of people. It really will. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it, it's there's there's no overnight solution to this. And uh, we're seeing this in leaders, you know, of countries who are doing a great job. Leaders of some states, Governor Cuomo in, in New York is doing a great job. But then you see some other leaders, I don't have to mention names, but clearly lack empathy. And uh, it's it's frustrating. Yeah. yeah. I have to remind myself to stay off of Twitter and stay off of that oh, person yeah. and to get away from it because uh, it's just, it just, again, trying to fight Sugar Ray Leonard in the dark, you're not going to be able to do it. No, and, and, and it's not going to help you. No, I bring the, your vibe down, and it's really and Mary Lou. You, Mary Lou, you talked about keeping your vibe high with gratitude. Right? Yeah, pick your battles. Pick your battles. Really, pick your battles because there's, there's, yeah, it's a big fight right now. Pick your battles, um, and and it's it's like that again. An old school coach, and they say, you know, there's no I in team. Well, there is an I in team. Is that invested, inspired, uh, invincible? You know all those attributes to start with the letter I that when you're a coach and you can invest in someone and get them to believe in themselves, great things, great things can occur. And, uh, you know, the I and team, I, I got my three kids and I like to think they're not panicked. They're not worried. And they're having a lot of fun. And again, I have a great ex-wife who's just an amazing person and we just choose to love and, and trust. And gratitude. Thank you for this today. Where do we reach you? You've got a great blog, and that that article just rocked my world when I, I read it last month. So yeah, where do we reach you, Ken? Well, you, uh, I have a website, Ken at uh, Kenabura dot com. Kenabura uh, Team Building Leadership and Coaching. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and Twitter, mm -hmm. and so you can find me there as well. And and uh, and on our nation, <laughs> in our nation as well. Yeah, doing the pregame with Darren Joseph. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, covering football. Now, here, here's the great thing: it doesn't rain every day, and uh, you know, you can't live in regret. Uh, I don't. I never regretted playing football. I'm donating my brain to science to the Boston University program when I leave this blue marble, but I do so only because you hear stories about guys who sort of go sideways off the rails. And if I ever did, I'd want there to be an explanation. Yeah. Well, Sufi Campbell, you know that happened to him. Yeah. And uh, Bob McEwen, uh, Fifth Estate, uh, yeah. PBC, he, he did the same thing. So. Yeah, I, had a, I have a, a big discussion with Bobby, and uh, I see other guys, and it'd be, it'd be uh, naive of me to think that I can walk through playing all that football and not have to pay a price. Yeah, well, I, I hope you don't. Hey, and, uh, thank you for this. What a, what a joy to You're always talking about leaving Milk, cotton, black and white food. Smile, thank you for the picture. Parents waiting in the driveway.